Hey guys, what's going on? It's Don here from Nervous Bear Tech and welcome back to the channel. And I recently decommissioned my server and I migrated all my stuff over to a NAS and also a Raspberry Pi. So let's check it out. Now, I do want to thank QNAP for sending the TS364 over to me for review and everything we talked about will be linked down in the description below. Now this is the latest product for the home and small office NAS. It is a three by two, which means it supports three hard drives and two NVMEs. Now it's got a pretty small footprint compared to the predecessor, which I was using before, which is this two bay NAS, but it does have its little downsides to it. To jump into the specs real quick, this has an Intel Celeron 5105, which has four cores and can go up to 2.9 gigahertz boost. It has, like I said earlier, supports three hard drives, two NVMEs, and this is the four gigabyte model. So it has four gigs of RAM, but it can support up to 16 gigs of RAM. It's also using 2.5 gigabit NIC, which I love because most of their newer series now supports 2.5 and it has USB 3.2, which supports up to 10 gigabits. Now this model, like all the other models also have that quick copy button in the front where you can stick a USB in front and copy this directly over to the hard drive. And it also has their signature HDMI in the back. So you can actually turn this into a media station if you wanted to. Now, the only downside to this, I feel it's a downside, but it might not be necessarily for you guys which is it doesn't have removable trays. Unlike their other model, like this one over here, where I could just slide this cap open and pull out the hard drives, this one requires a disassembly. So I'm gonna show you that right now. So first you have three screws in the back. Once you take that off, you can slide the case off from the side and there it will reveal the three trays. You're gonna to have to remove those three trays just to get to the NVMe on the bottom. But I do like the fact that they have the clip-ons if that's what you would call it, to snap the NVMEs in and you don't have to worry about screws. Once you're done with the two NVMEs, if you want to upgrade the RAM, you, should, you can do so right now. But otherwise, you can now repeat the process and install the hard drives. The trays don't require screws, so you could just clip it onto the side and slide it in. Now, if you want to use 2.5 inch hard drives, you do need to purchase additional trays just so it can support the 3.5 to 2.5 conversion. Once you're done installing all three hard drives, you can reverse the process, install the three screws, and that is it. You are done. Now, as far as the price on this guy, it's $449 and I find it very reasonable for what you get. Now, if you're planning to just use this as a NAS or storage, then yeah, it is a little bit overpriced because you could just pick up something that is not this powerful for... I don't know, way under $100 just for a NAS. But if you are planning to do what I'm using it for, which is convert my server or migrate all my server utilities over to this guy and this guy, then yeah, this is actually a very reasonable price. Like I said, it depends what your usage is. Now it has an Intel Celeron in here, which also has integrated GPU, which also supports QuickSync, which allows for transcoding for Plex Media Server. So that's one of the bigger things I would run with this guy, which is a Plex Media Server or Jellyfin. On top of that, it also supports virtualization, so you could run VMs on this, and also supports containers like Dockers. So you could also install a bunch of utilities into this guy as well. Now, if you're using the QNAP OS, they also have their own utilities, which is like their, their own surveillance system, antivirus, backup utilities, a ton of other stuff. So yeah, just this one guy alone, you could install a ton of applications, which justifies the price. Realistically, if you're using all the utilities, then yeah, it's a pretty good deal. Now I felt confident enough to decommission my own server, which is this guy right over here, and move everything over to this NAS as well as the Raspberry Pi. So it goes to show how much you can do with one of these guys now. Now, as far as the Raspberry Pi goes, I have a full series on this, which is called Pi Hosted, where I run a bunch of containers or dockers into this guy. We also have our custom made template just for Portainer to install all the applications that will support the Raspberry Pi. So please check that out. I'll leave a playlist right over here. Now, as far as this guy goes, I will be showing you all the apps that I have installed that make sense to me. We're going to jump into that in just a sec. Now, keep in mind that I will be using a NAS that is similar to this model, but not exactly this one itself. So everything we talk about is similar. It is transferable. So I, if I'm going to install Plex on that one, you can install Plex on this one, et cetera, et cetera. So with that in mind, Let's jump into the apps. All right, so what we have going on over here is the Nastopia uh, dashboard. Uh, you will get this with most version of QNAP, so this is what you would normally see. Now, this is a default installation, and I'm just gonna show you around on um, what we got going on with the Nastopia, which is the 365. So first, we're gonna go into the dashboard right over here, and you can see 
This is the main tad bits of what you would see, what's going on, hard drive if it fails, what model number. If you want more information, you could just go over to hardware information and it'll pop up with how much gigs of RAM, what's free, what it's using. And you could see this one is actually the Intel N5105 and all the temperatures of what you got going on. Now this is a system information as well. So it's similar to what you would get with hardware information, just slimmed down. Now you are able to get up to 16 gigs of RAM with this guy. So yeah, I'm only using about four. That's what the default is comes with. And it has a 2.5 gigabit ethernet adapter. So yeah, this is all the information uh, as part of this guy. All right, so here we have all the storage information. This is how our QNAP looks like. And it has disc one, disc two, disc three with the M.2s and you're able to actually see all the performances and how the lifespan is. Uh, the M.2 over here, which says 96%, which is accurate because this is one of my older 250 gigabytes SSD and having 96% should be pretty accurate. Now, if I go over to settings, you'll be able to see that I actually have it in two RAID groups and that's what it requires to do the Q tiering. And when you first set it up, it'll actually go through the whole process of Q tier so you know what you're getting. And basically what it does is that the SSDs act as hot storage while your hard drives act as cold storage. So everything when you transfer the data over to your QNAP, it actually gets stored into your SSDs first and then slowly transferred into your hard drive. And then when you're pulling data, it does the same thing. It actually pulls the data into the SSD internally and then it'll actually upload data from your SSD, which increases the speed and performance of your network speed, especially if you're using something like the 2.5 gigabit. Now I'm gonna jump into a already established QNAP that I've been using for I think the past year now. And I call that nasty. You've probably seen a video of me setting this one up. And these are all the apps and what I do with this guy into the NAS universe basically. So to jump into it, I'm gonna show you my dashboard right over here. And you could see that it is running a different CPU. This one is using an Intel CPU, I mean a Ryzen CPU, has eight threads instead of uh, four threads. So it's a little bit more capable of running a little bit more VMs. I threw in 16 gigabytes of RAM into this guy and I have nine gigabytes free, which means I am fully using like at least five or more gigabytes from this guy. Like I'm using a lot of gig. I don't have any M.2s installed into this guy, which I do want to to do the whole Q tiering with this, but I have this established for so long, I'm kind of iffy about adding the M.2s on here for now. But I do want to in the future because I am running into a little bit of a performance issue when I do run 10 gigabits. Now, what I got going on in here is virtualization. I do run two virtual servers in here for now. And the NAS is so capable of running virtual machines and a lot of other stuff that I decided to move some of the stuff over to this NAS. Now, one, I have my Resolve database. So this is my editor, my Resolve. It requires a very particular version of the database for it to run. And that's why I have to run a VM, roll back the version of the database for Resolve to kind of work properly. And when I edit, I could edit on multiple machines and it'll be saved to this one location. So if I edit off this Linux machine and then I go to my Windows machines upstairs, the edits that I made here will directly reflect what I made over there as well. So I would see the changes. That's why I need to run this database because sometimes I don't wanna be in front of my computer just editing. I wanna be you know, sitting somewhere else or doing it remotely. Now, the next thing I have is my Debian box. This box is my backdoor machine. That's what I call it because if there are any cases that I accidentally screwed up my firewall configurations or somehow my IP change or the modem isn't working properly or something did not work fun something did not function properly with my wire guard or my connection to the house. This has all my connections backdoor into here. So I have Tailscale, uh, AnyDesk, and some other applications on here for remote sessions. This way I have a way to get back into this location without having to really come back here physically to reboot something. So that's my backdoor machine. I always have to have one just in case. Now I am planning to squeeze more VMs in here for testing purposes. Like if I need to test out a new Linux box, I might just use this to test. And what I do like about the virtualization station is that I could actually run this off of a web browser. So if I go to HTTP nasty, and I think it's 8088, this will bring me right to my virtualization station and it's a full browser experience itself. I don't have to run into this little tiny one. I could just use it from here and it looks exactly the same. So yeah, that's why I'm using this. Now, next up I have is my Dockers. Now I do run Dockers on here. Uh, most of my Dockers are ran off Raspberry Pi now, but I do have some that requires a lot of storage that will be thrown onto this one. 
So the first one I have is my land cache. This is a huge one. This is um, gives me the ability to Steam cache all my games. So basically when I download a game off the internet, like say Forza 5, and that's 109 gigabytes. Now I do a lot of testing with other machines that requires me to run the same game. So it makes no sense for me to run my internet to download the game off the internet again and again and again. So the Steam cache is where it comes into play where I have to only download it once it actually goes through my NAS, stores it into the NAS, so where I could get it later. So once I download Forza 5 once, the next time I download it, it'll just grab from my NAS. And because my NAS is, well, this one is 10 gigabits, I could grab it really fast, which means I don't actually have to store the games on my main PC if I don't need to, because I could always just re-download it off my NAS almost instantly. So that is a huge thing, and it does take up a lot of space. So I'm using about, I think one terabyte or two terabytes of storage just for games and it recycles. So if you use up all one terabyte or two terabyte, whatever the case may be, it'll just recycle some of the old ones and, you know, fill in the new games and stuff like that. So depending on how much storage you have, um, you allocate whatever you can. Now, the next up I have is your backup server, which is a really good imaging software. I use this for basically all the PCs I have here in the house. So all them, Many pieces that you see me reviewing, I do a your backup first. I have a full image copy of it. So if I ever need to restore it back to original state, I have an image. Same thing with these PCs. Every seven days, it gets imaged off to this server. So my main desktop, my laptops, this machine, if something was to happen or hardware fails or something, I could always just restore it back to the previous state and your backup is what I use to do that. So these are the two big hitters that requires a lot of storage. So sometimes when I'm using your backup and the hard drives takes up 50, 60 gigabytes, it's gonna take 50 or 60 gigabytes to back it up, you know? So your backup and land cache. Now, if I didn't have my Raspberry Pi for my Pi hosted series, this would be filled up with a lot more stuff because I'm actually running my WireGuard on there. I'm running BitTorrent client on there, a couple of downloaders, stuff like that I would have running into this aisle. So NAS is like this is more capable now than it was back in the day. So I actually can afford to decommission my Dell server just to run everything off this NAS. Next up is another big one, which is my Plex Media Server. Now, since this NAS, which is the TS473A, or even the one that we were just reviewing, which is the 364, you're actually able to run Plex Media Server on there. Now, it's gonna be a little bit easier to run off the NASTopia or the 364A because it has an Intel QuickSync. So the GPU that is built into the CPU can actually do all the transcoding. As for the Nasty, it does have a Vega GPU in here. The problem is uh, Plex doesn't really support AMD graphic cards, so I actually ended up having to throw in hardware in here just so I could do hardware transcoding. So this is not the perfect box, the 476, to do transcoding, but because I have my own graphic card, you see over here, the NVIDIA Corporation, Quattro, P400, I'm able to do a ton more transcoding with an actual graphic card like this. So there's different routes that you could go, but ultimately, I run my Plex server and it's huge on this guy. Like it runs all my media and everything. And I have uh, thumbnail generations and uh, it skips the intros. This could do it all. Now, another big thing that I throw on here is my QVR. So I'm not going to show this, but the QVR is my um, security camera system. So now my QNAP actually runs all my security cameras inside my house and it films everything down. It also has face tracking and a ton of other stuff that you can enable, uh, scheduling as well as motion sensor, tons of stuff. So I'm using, an, again, yet a lot of storage on the QVR. So this is what I'm always running. Now you could always get more applications through the app center and you could fill this up a lot. And what's cool is that obviously I need to update all these things, but what's cool is that if you really needed to, you can actually um, go into settings and app repository and add in a third party app repository, which means the apps that you see here is not the only apps you could get. There are libraries out there with a ton more other applications that you could load in. Like for instance, I think I have it here. Maybe I could find it or maybe I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't see it right now, but uh, I pref three to test your network connections. It's not generally inside the QNAP store. So you would have to use the third party libraries just to get the iPref. 
and there's a lot more other libraries that you could get. Now, keep in mind that they're third party, so they're not qualified or signed through QNAP, so it could have a possibility of breaking something or worse, maybe downloading a virus by accident. So just be very careful of what you're downloading and know what you're downloading before you're downloading it. Otherwise, that is it for me, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Do I miss my main server? Uh, I do a little because I do like the fact that if I needed to test an operating system or if I needed to pull resources, um, make a VM that is like 16 core and 24 gigs of RAM and stuff like that. I, I love the fact that I could do that, but without that ability, it's not a full loss cause because I could still use and run VMs off this and test my operating systems as well, just not as powerful as I would if I'm running a server. Will I eventually bring back the server? I will. I mean, I'm just keeping it off for the meantime to see how much I could run with this and how much I could run my entire home network without running an actual server. And then I could repurpose that for something else. So in the meantime, I am going to run with this. I am going to fully load this out. I'm going to fully load this out see where my limitations are before I start spinning up my server again. Now, if you guys have any questions, uh, please jump onto my Discord. There's a bunch of good guys over there that will help you out. You guys can also leave some questions down in the comments below. If you guys are new to this channel, consider subscribing and also hitting that bell notification icon so you know when the next video is going to be out. And as I say, my Nerd Cave, hack till it hurts.